Hello, Malcolm here with the first of two classes this December 2022 for the Thames Valley Churches of Christ to help us to review the year that God has just given us and to prepare a some sense of vision for the year that God is going to give us in 2023. The idea is to use these classes for personal reflection, but also we can use them in our family groups, our locations, or whatever small group you're part of. So I hope you find it helpful. Now we're going to use the church in Thyatira, in Revelation chapter 2 is a bit of a framework for us. Not everything will apply directly, but I like the framework we see there of how Jesus, how the Spirit and Jesus are helping the church to think about where they are at the moment spiritually and where they can grow and be more like Christ and be more like what God had intended them to be as they look forward to the future. So it's a bit of looking at the, the recent past and where we are now and thinking about the future. So we're going to split this passage in Revelation chapter 2 verses 18 to 29 into two parts. The first part is reviewing and the second part is looking ahead. So I hope you find this useful. Let's dig into the text straight away and see what we might find. In verse 18 of chapter 2, it says that the, to the angel of the church in Thyatira say or write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. These are great words of encouragement, and I really think they apply to Thames Valley. Nevertheless, verse 20, something to think about here, something actually quite serious to think about. I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children dead, Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. So this is the review part. We're going to go on to verses 26 to 29 next time to talk about vision for next year. A few thoughts, and then that'll, I hope, provoke some thinking and some discussion in our smaller groups. So where are we? Well, this is where Lydia comes from in Acts chapter 16. You may remember her. It's the central letter of all the letters in Revelation, and it's the longest one. It seems to have great significance. And today we're not comparing ourselves directly with Thyatira, but more about seeing the way Jesus approaches the church to help us to think about the year just gone. Note that the letter begins with an inspiring picture of Jesus. So this isn't really, this review isn't really all about you and me or our church. It's really about finding a, a better picture of Jesus. He's the, uh, they've got the blazing fire, the burnished bronze. I mean, th this is the son of God. That's, that's the point. So Jesus' opinion about us is what matters, right? Uh, not the opinions of other people, or in a sense, not even our own feelings and opinions about ourselves. So here are some things to think about. Number one, here's a question. What has gone well this year? What's gone well for you and your group? What has gone well? List it out. Don't, don't think this doesn't matter. It's important to celebrate what God has given us. Yesterday, I was at Brenda Milburn's funeral. It was a sad occasion in many ways, but it was a celebration in others because Brenda lived her life well. And much of what we talked about yesterday, as John Partington did and led that service wonderfully, is a reflection on the wonderful things that Brenda did and the way that God used her and worked in her life and the fruit that's come from that in so many different ways. We're celebrating what has gone well in her life. She's now with, going to be with God forever. We're, we're confident of her place with God. Now and again, we've got to list it out, and it shouldn't wait for a funeral, necessarily, you know, for, for us to think about the good things that God has been doing. So what has been going well? List it out. He says, uh, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance. I mean, that's great. And that you're doing more than you did at first. So they have been growing. Their love is real. They prioritize love. They are growing in that sense. Uh, it reminds me of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, which is our theme verse for 2023, by the way, getting a sneak peek at this. It says in 1 Thess 1, 3, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a Christ-focused uh, faith, work, love, uh, endurance, and labor, all these things inspired by Christ. There's a lot of that in Thames Valley. 
a lot of good things like that. What are the good things like that where you are? And their love isn't intellectual, right? It's practical. Like it says in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Or Acts 10, 38, where it summarizes the life of Jesus as the fact that he went around doing good. It's very simple. Good things have been happening. What are those? That's number one. Number two, second question, what needs improvement? What is God bringing to your attention that needs improving in your life and the life of your, of your communal faith group? And one of the questions to ask about what needs to be improved is what's being tolerated that shouldn't be tolerated, what sins are apparent. And Jesus brings them out very clearly straight here. It's to do with somebody called Jezebel. May not have been a literal name, a literal uh, a name of an actual person, but nonetheless, there is somebody who is calling themselves a prophet, but misleading God's people into sexual morality at eat, eating meat sacrificed to idols. Not a good thing. If you want to re re review the original Jezebel, which you might want to do, 1 Kings 16 uh, and 2 Kings chapter 9, uh, the, uh, it's, it's a, uh, she had a lot of uh, problems, right? Who is she in, in this context, perhaps? Who does she represent? Uh, we don't know. It could have been Lydia herself who turned bad. It could have been the wife of a church leader in Thyatira is another theory. It could have been a local pagan prophetess. It could have been a symbolic representative of the Thyatiran church that was struggling with issues of, of immorality and idol worship or, or eating meat, sacrifice to idols. Or it could have been a prominent woman claiming to be a prophetess, a charismatic female teacher, maybe. I think what we can say about Jezebel is, as somebody said, she was the baddest of all the bad girls in the Bible. And whoever this is, is having a very negative, deleterious effect on the church spiritually. And immorality is happening and eating meat, sacrifice to idols is happening. And it is very bad for the spiritual health of the church. Just a side note, if you're interested about the eating meat, sacrifice to idols, why that's so significant. It's a trade guild issue of the day in that culture. Uh, if you wanted to network and be accepted in local business, you had to take part in these feasts. That's the way it worked especially in a, if you were prominent, uh, especially these, these guilds were prominent and numerous in Thyatira and you had to attend if you wanted to get on in the world, so to speak. It wasn't only for trade, it was a bit like a club in a sense. And so perhaps this Jezebel type person is saying something like, you know there's only one true God and these tin pot so-called gods are no gods at all when you go to these, these meals. And since you know this to be true, you can participate, you can go, it's okay, because you know different. It doesn't really mean anything. But what's happening is Christians are compromising, and they're allowing the pressures of the culture and society around them to force them into behaviors that are not Christ-like. So are there anything, is there anything like that in your life and in your group that you're tolerating, that Jesus would say, tolerate it no more? And third question, third question. What will be the consequences if you don't pay attention to the things that God has brought to your attention that really need to change? What might the consequences be? There are always consequences when we live in a way not consistent with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yeah? He says here, he tells the church in uh, Thyatira what the, the consequences will be. He says, uh, I will strike her children dead. Literally, I will kill her children with death in the Greek. And they need to re repent themselves. You know, I, I, I will repay each of you according to your deeds. So he's saying, you can't hide behind Jezebel and say, oh, it's all Jezebel's fault, or it's all my leader's fault, or it's all my spouse's fault, or it's my children's fault, or it's my parents' fault, or it's my whatever fault. He says, no, 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 I'm going to repay you according to your deeds. So we've got to take responsibility for our own, our own uh, spiritual uh, failings and where we are not taking seriously what God is bringing to our attention. So let's do that. Let's take responsibility because we know that God will help us. He knows the hearts and minds, as he says here. He, we, he knows our heart and our minds. And it's healthy, isn't it? It's healthy to own up when things at home are not spiritually healthy. Uh, it's better to do that before God feels the need to intervene. So let's get honest with God and perhaps with each other to help each other be stronger. It's interesting that perhaps part of the reason it's put like this here is because the uh, Thyatira was a garrison town of Roman legions uh, or a Roman legion because the city was vulnerable. Geographically, the way it was structured, it was vulnerable to attack. So they stationed a Roman legion there. And it's like a weak town acting strong. 
And perhaps that gave the disciples the feeling that they had to show their strength by indulging in risky behavior in these meals and with this immorality that was going on. And the members of the church in Thyatira and no doubt regarded themselves as strong Christians, or maybe they were just pretending to be strong Christians or feeling they needed to be, but they weren't really strong. When we feel strong, we can make the error of believing that we're immune to the sort of temptations to sin that we think are behind us. We can have a false sense of our strength or pretend and then not be on our guard in the way that we should. And that's why times of soberness and reflection like this are so helpful. And what does Jesus say here at the end of verse 24? I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. Jesus doesn't want to impose and will not impose anything on you and me that is beyond our ability to carry. He's not going to burden us with, with things that are too heavy for us. The Christian life is simpler than we might think. It seems to be going back to Acts 15, 28, to what happened at the Jerusalem Council. There's not much for them to hold to. Sometimes even that seems hard, doesn't it? Living up to our calling sometimes feels hard, but it's not complicated. And Jesus is there to carry our burdens with us. That's why we have times of quiet with God. That's why we pray. That's why we read God's word ourselves, because we need his strength to carry the actually light burden, but the burden that's, that creates tension because we are living in a, in, a, in a different life, a lifestyle in this world, and that can cause challenges for us all. You know, Brenda's funeral, as I referred to earlier, was a wonderful reflection on a faithful life and of her reward in the next. It's times like that that help us to reflect on our own lives, and it certainly did that for me. I would like to encourage all of us to take some time personally and with our groups to reflect on what God has been teaching us this year and ask ourselves these three questions. Let's go back over them. Number one, what has gone well? Much has gone well. Discuss it, pray about it, thank God for it. Secondly, what needs improvement? In other words, what is being tolerated? What sins might need to be repented of? What has God been bringing to your attention? And thirdly, what will the consequences be if you don't pay attention to those things? What might actually happen spiritually to you and the people around you and with your group if you don't take these things seriously? Let's be sober about that. Being sober isn't the end of it. There is confidence in God. And then there's vision we're going to talk about next time. But we'll have to wait for that until we come back again. I hope you find this useful. Please let me know if you have any questions. You can email me, malcolm at malcolmcox.org, or you can see me, find me on the website, malcolmcox.org. And until the next time, I hope you have a wonderful time of reviewing what God has done and what he's teaching you. And until that next time, take care and God bless.